So my, my talk has two parts. The first part builds on what Wouter has presented this morning by VRP. He, uh, he finished with it. I'm going to start with it. So there's nice continuity there. Um, the second part of it is about an application, why I need this price collecting in the first place, which is on urban waste collection. So yeah, let's get started. So this uh, PyVRP is joint work between me, uh, Leon, and Wouter, and it builds, um, it builds on, on what Wouter did as a, a, in, in the Dymax competition. Um, then we took that as a baseline in the Euro Europe's competition and um, continued from there. Um, so this is a brief recap of a few of the main things we changed to that baseline. And uh, core one, so we added Python binding so we could use it from Python, which uh, was a bit easier for us to work with, particularly because we also wanted to reuse um, this solver for the dynamic variant. Um, we changed, it, it, uh, it's, built, it's built on HGS by uh, Thibault, so it's a genetic, algor uh, genetic search algorithm. Um, we have a crossover component, which creates this offspring. Um, you want to select two parents there that will hopefully lead to a good offspring solution. And one of the things we did here was that we added a diversity, a simple diversity criterion here, that you select parents that are somewhat related. So they're, they're diverse enough, but not too diverse. Because if you have two, two solutions that are way out there, after crossover, you're gonna get a solution that has the worst traits of both of them. Uh, but if you select two parents that are basically identical, you're going to end up with the same solution after crossover anyway. So you want to find a balance there. And this was a really simple, simple change to make that worked fairly well. We modified the local search, the educate step a little bit. Um, in particular, we got rid of a lot of code by uh, generalizing um, the operators a bit to general NM exchange, taking a segment of N, N uh, customers from one route, M customers from the other, and swapping them. A lot of operators are of that form. Um, we also simplified a lot of things. We, we got lit, rid of a giant tool representation and a lot of things related to that that we did not need for this. And we did a lot of tuning on the remaining parameters. And now, uh, simple question, which of these parts do you think mattered most for our performance? Yes, that one and the simplification. So, um, the top ones are nice to have. Um, simplifying was worth quite a bit to our performance. I'm not saying it, it generalizes, but for us, simplifying things, removing parameters to make the parameter tuning easier. I mean, the easiest parameter to tune is the, to tune is the one you don't have. Um, that really helped. Tuning was quite hard to do. Um, I tried initially, I had, I had high hopes for um, a few of the more machine learning oriented hyperparameter tuning packages. I tried those. Uh, I, a few of them. They did not work for me, uh, for our team, because, and that's, that's my hypothesis here, right? I don't have proof. Um, because the solutions we get are already fairly good. This is a good algorithm. The baseline was already good. Um, the solutions I want to get are slightly better, but the noise just over different seeds of, of running them, the noise is massive. So you're looking for performance improvements that are really marginal compared to just the noise between different runs. And that, that did not work a lot better than being really prescriptive in the different sets of parameters you do, then evaluating those in detail and selecting the best one you have. This could be on me, but this was one of the things that surprised me a lot, that after, after a few days of running, running one of those algorithms, it still had not conclusively found a better uh, configuration than the one we started with. Whereas being really prescriptive in the options you have and evaluating those in detail did lead to um, quite a bit better parameter configurations. So that's um, our NeuroEurope st static solver. Now I'm going to PyVRP. So some of this I've already said. So it bundles um, uh, Wouter's, Wouter's uh, winning uh, Dymax solver and, and our static solver that won the static part of the Euro Europe's competition. It, uh, it's an open source package. You can, you can use this today. One of the big things we did 
was write a lot more documentation. I think uh, at least half of my past four months have been writing documentation, uh, both for the function endpoints, um, on how to use it, how to, how to install it, um, how to compile this. It um, should be, hopefully, somewhat easy to use. No guarantees claimed there. <laughs> Um, this is a work in progress. One of the big things we did do was we added a lot of, uh, lot of tests to it, just to make sure that the individual components work the way we designed them. Um, and right now we support CVRP, um, VP time windows, and this price collecting bit. There are a few more extensions planned, um, heterogeneous fleet, um, multiple depots at some point perhaps. <laughs> Um, but if you have your own ideas, um, please open an issue, a pull request, anything you like. And you can use this today by just installing it from the Python package index as well. So this is more of an over slide on what, or overview slide on, on what we want to achieve with PyVRP. Um, one of them is, of course, performance. Um, we, we claim some performance guarantees like this works really well and is state of the art on at least a few, few uh, combinations of different VRP aspects. Um, to achieve this, uh, we both have a fairly rigorous benchmarking setup and parts of it are in C++. So it's a Python package, but the core parts, the performance, the really performant parts are all in C++ and we use PyBind to uh, connect it to. So the second one ties back a bit to what we heard earlier also on the exact one, on the uh, exact um, solvers. Like some good, good software practices. Um, and here I mostly, mostly mean that we have a lot of um, pipelines set up to, to lint this, uh, to even test if it compiles, to run all the tests and to do the deployments, but also modularity. Like a lot of these things tie together. This is meant to be somewhat usable also if you don't necessarily know or care about uh, the C++ part. So it's modular enough that a lot of these things can be configured from, Py from uh, the Python side. Um, I think that's a big change compared to also what we had for uh, the Euroneurip solver. Um, in there, a lot of these things were still hard coded, like these are the crossover operators you have. It's going to be uh, ordered exchange or SREX, and this is it. Um, a lot of uh, the granular neighborhood structure, there's one, and that's, that's the one you're going to get. Um, a lot of this is now configurable from the Python side as well. So you don't have to necessarily set up your own, your own local environment to compile stuff if you have Python. And you can write this, you, you can write a thing that creates a few lists with clients. You're on your way to uh, test how much this matters in PyVRP. Um, so that helps with a lot of research that is VRP related, but not necessarily algorith algorithmically itself, and more, more on like, hey, how much does this component of such an algorithm matter? Um, if you're not necessarily interested in building your own educator, but more, I have a thing that works well, I have this other concept, how important are different, different settings here? And yeah, the ease of use, uh, we have examples, we have API documentation, um, and we take some care to hide the C++, so you only have to know how, to, how Python works. Um, and if, unless you really want to develop parts that, that touch the C++, Python is enough. So this can always be improved. The documentation can always be improved. But we have, uh, we've taken a stab at it. So just a bit of an overview. The first release was, May, uh, was uh, March 1st. Then a second release, which contains a lot of um, quality of life improvements, uh, including a few improvements described by other Euro and Europe's teams. Um, one of these is that in the granular neighborhoods, you don't necessarily need to go through your um, clients in the particular order in which you got them. Like you do client first, client one first, then client two. You can also just order them by a proximity value. That helps a bit in variance reduction between seats. 
We didn't necessarily get much better, much better performance out of it, but evaluated over multiple seeds, the variance between different runs reduced quite a bit. Um, we generalized the tournament. You don't necessarily need to do a binary tournament. You can, uh, you can also do, select multiple individuals and take the best according to the home criterion. So there are a lot of different ideas that branched off from this baseline HGS solver that we're trying to tie back together now. Um, and then, two days ago, um, release 030, that includes prize collecting. So everything I'm going to talk about today is already available and you could use it if you want to. That was basically the last thing I did before I got on the plane here. Um, so I'm now going to switch. That's basically a, a short overview of PyVP. I'm now going to switch to price collecting and um, how it works, why I need it. This, this nicely ties into what Patrick explained earlier already as well. So we can be fairly brief on it, I think. So a, a bit of standard notation. Um, this xij is if we're using, X, uh, if we're using uh, edge i to j, in, uh, in our solution or not, yi if we're even visiting no uh, vertex i in the first place, and then an objective of the form that is basically minimize travel distance plus the value of all, all clients you're not visiting. Now the first term there is, is just a constant, this pi i times one, so that drops out of the objective, and then the second part is then the value of all the um, clients you are visiting. So it's distance minus prizes, more or less. This is nice because it's positive. This, is, this, is always, this entire term is always not negative. Um, so this is, this is the problem we're trying to solve. The implementation, I, uh, we tried two things. The first one is a bit different in its representation in that you can have different route objects for uh, different, different routes in your solution. Uh, one of the ideas I had was, what if we make a virtual route where you put all the unvisited customers in and then do all the operators we already have between that virtual route and existing routes, routes we actually want to, want to, uh, want to execute on. That the benefit of this is you get all the operators you already have. You don't need to do many changes there. The operators already work on routes. This is just another route. Um, that was nice. It's fairly complicated. Um, so we also tried another thing, which is this. Um, basically, you can just insert, insert clients if they're not yet in. You can remove clients if they're in, but you don't necessarily need them. And that works really well. So this is way simpler than uh, another thing where we really toyed with the uh, solution representation. The implementation we have is somewhat more general than the problem I'm currently solving. So you also have this required field. Like it's not just price collecting, you can mix and match. If you have some parts that you need to visit no matter what, so they don't necessarily need to have, have a price, it doesn't matter, you just have to go there. And other parts where that is not required, um, the implementation can handle this. So that's nice if you have a problem that is not quite price collecting, but also not quite a full, you have to do everything uh, VRP. So for the, uh, for the removal, just remove. For the insertion, we do apply a granular neighborhood restriction. So not every client pair, uh, every combination of clients is evaluated, only clients that are in a neighborhood of you. Now I get to the slide I'm least, least sure about. <laughs> mostly, mostly because I'm about to betray my own ignorance. <laughs> um, I'm not aware of any existing large benchmark instances that solve price collecting problems. And by large, I mean, say, 500 or more customers. Um, they might exist. I haven't found them yet. I've checked the popular repositories. Um, if any one of you knows about them, <laughs> and I haven't, haven't found them yet, please let me know, because I'll gladly repeat this exercise. Um, what I did now is I just derived a few new ones from, from standard benchmark instances for VRP with time windows. I added uh, prizes in a manner that is also known already. And then you get instances that are not pathological. That was basically what I, what I went for here. Uh, instances where solutions we have found so far are not all zero, all zero no, no clients visited or all clients visited. Like you want some spread, right? Else, else you're not doing an interesting prize collection problem. 
Um, we have that, that's good. And the second part was I need an algorithm to compare against on how well I'm even solving these instances in the first place. And the unlucky victim here was Patrick. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I, uh, I took your code <laughs> and, uh, and I, I ran it on these instances. Same, uh, same, same architecture, same runtime, average over 10 seats. Um, this is what came out of that. I fixed uh, the git commit hashes. That's what you see somewhere in the picture. Mostly because these best known solutions update basically every time because they're very new. And every time I run the thing, I get new best known solutions. So just saying I took them on this date is not enough. Sometimes there are three updates on a date. Um, our PyVRP thing updates very, very regularly as well. So saying I took this version or I took um, the version as it was released on like GitHub is also not enough because PyVRP a month ago is not PyVRP today or PyVRP one month from now. So this might be a thing that if you're already using a Git repository, um, just saying we use this code, maybe just fix your Git commit hashes somewhere. Like this was the version I ran. Um, something to think about. Maybe a good recommendation for the list as well. It might be like a next step because then you first need to be using a repository <laughs> to get here. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, my conclusion from this is uh, you have these instance groups. Um, I think the interpretation of C1, C2, R1, etc. this is very well known. Um, it worked very well based on the only al other algorithm I know about. This, uh, this seems reasonable. Now we're getting to a part that I want to build on also in the urban waste collection problem. We have these granular neighborhoods and they're basically a restriction of the entire edge set to a set that is likely to be part of a good solution. So a lot of edges, if, if you look at a VRP, you're not gonna cross from one side of the map to the other. It's fairly unlikely. So you can just ignore that edge altogether and restrict your, your search space to a set of edges that is likely to be part of this without losing a lot of quality along the way. You're not necessarily restricting the, the set where an optimal or near optimal solution might be. You do gain a lot in performance because a lot of edges you never have to evaluate. Um, that's the idea of these. What we have now is um, based on Thibaut's work. Um, we basically compute a cost, this delta ij, for each edge that's based on some characteristics of the problem. So you have the distance in there, um, some characteristics all based on the duration and, and the, the, the time characteristics, like the minimum amount of time you would have to wait at node j if you leave uh, node i at its very latest moment. Um, on the opposite side, the minimum amount of time warp you would have if you left um, I, I at its very earliest and wanted to arrive at uh, J at its very latest. So this time warp is based on like a smooth objective so you can go back in time. It's infeasible, but you can go back in time um, to still service it at uh, its latest possible time. So these are like two, two ways of, of getting a very, very nonlinear, very complex um, duration distance interaction into a measure of how far apart these two nodes are. There is, in a sense, already an admission of defeat in here, <laughs> because um, while distance is very natural, just one number, once you get to time, you have a lot more different, difficult interactions. It's very hard to linearize this into one number. So what we find is that a good parameter for k in the case of CVRP is, is in 10 to 20 on instances up to, up to 1,000 customers. Whereas for uh, VRPs with time windows, you need more because this is already not a good approximation of, of that problem. It works very well, but you need a larger, larger neighborhood to get to really quality solutions. We found that after some tuning to be between 30 to 40, which is much bigger than just for CVRP. Um, okay, so for Pi VRP, this idea is that this delta ij approximates a cost of, of this edge. Um, of course, with price collecting, you get more 
it's not just a cost. If you use arc ij to, of edge ij to get to j, that's the edge that gets you the price at j, which is an objective change that both has this cost component, but also has a price component to it. And it seems very simple <laughs> to just use delta, this delta ij minus the price you get at j um, if you use this edge. Um, so there are two things I wanted to check here now that are both both uh, items on this list, on this, uh, this slide. The first, I want to make sure that we converge or we'll get to a solution after a long run time that is either better but not worse than what we were already using. Like the, I, I want this convergence to a good solution over time to remain in place. So the neighborhood needs to contain those good solutions, the, the, the granular neighborhood. At the same time, I also want performance to, be, to improve if I have a lot less time, um, say one minute. And then I expect if we restrict the neighborhood using this delta, delta P rather than delta, to slightly improve the average objectives. And that indeed appears to be the case. You'll see if you make K smaller, your search space decreases significantly and you much more quickly get to a good solution, you also get stuck there. So then more runtime doesn't necessarily help. You're stuck in that neighborhood. So that's why you want K to be big. If you're looking for a really good solution, uh, maybe a new best known solution after a lot of time, but in practice, K can be really small if you're solving this, not necessarily to any, any new, new best known solution. You're just interested in a good solution fast. So that is also something to maybe more practically oriented um, take out of this. K can be pretty small if you are really time constrained. And that is uh, basically price collecting in uh, PyVP as it is today. Now we're getting to the second bit of this talk. Um, so this is price collecting for urban waste collection, where I reuse the PyVRP stuff to do the price collecting here. Um, this is joint work with Myerline and Nikki. And I'm going to describe the setting a little bit. How am I on time? Oh. So this was born out of personal annoyance. I. Uh, I live in this city. Um, I have an underground container that looks like that on my street corner. I go there every once in a while to dump my bag. And more often than I would like, uh, the thing is full and I cannot deposit it. So um, that bothered me. <laughs> so I emailed them like, hey, I think we can do better. I don't know how you guys do it, but I think we can do better. Um, the municipality was really nice about it. And I mean, you all know bureaucracy. Six to seven weeks later, they sent me an email. I was like, that is fast. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but they were really interested. Um, they were very open about it too. They, uh, they were willing to share data on, on what they have uh, on, on their process now. I got to talk to a lot of them to un better understand what's going on now, how they do this, and uh, figure out if we can help them with this. Um, so what they have, on the one hand, they have a, a standard VRP. They need to visit these containers, em uh, empty them into their garbage trucks, then dump it, uh, dump all that stuff at the waste collection site. So that's just, that's a, a standard VRP. They need to select the containers to visit, but once they've done that, this is a VRP. Um, they want to limit the amount of times this overflow happens. So basically the amount of times I walk up to the thing and I can't deposit my bag inside of it, you're technically not allowed to put it next to it. It happens a lot. Um, so that's really not nice. So there's this, this, this joint objective between on the one hand wanting to minimize distance, the, the, the distance traveled, and on the other hand wanting to limit these overflows. Because to limit that, you, need, you should ideally just visit everything every day. Um, but that's really costly. They have, this is fairly interesting, um, what makes this not trivial, they know the arrivals or the number of people at, arriving at these containers because to open them you have to have your card, you have to put it on the thing and then it checks that you are at the right container and then you get to open it. So they have real-time data on these arrivals but they do not know the fill rate. 
they just know someone has been here to deposit their bag. Um, the container does not track its weight or how full it is, so they do not know the exact fill rate at any point in time. There is a bit on this, but it is, um, let, let's put it this way, the column that is supposed to track that is not well understood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in practice, I'm assuming no. Um, the, the thing they track is, I think, more related to how well the thing opened or something. I, I got an explanation, but it was not satisfying. So the, the short answer is no. The long answer is maybe if we ever figure out what that number means. So what they do now is, is really simple. They, have, they, they know these arrivals, they know roughly, it's not perfect, but they have a rough idea of after how many arrivals the thing is full. So they, they estimate a bit what the rate of arrival is and then they predict when, when with that rate, at what point in time that container will be full. They rank all the containers based on date and they take the, the top 300, top 400 and visit those on, on that day. So then they make a shift plan that becomes a route plan. This is really a simple rule of thumb uh, type approach. And what we thought here, this is where the price collecting comes in. If we can get a good estimate of the probability that a particular container will be full before the end of the next shift, because we can go there now, if we don't go here now, the next time we get to make that decision is in the next shift. And if we do it then, the, the absolute latest we're going to be there will be at the end of that shift. So you need, this, is, this, this ties into that, that uh, epoch dependence of if you don't do it now, you will do it later. Um, and I need to balance the future cost of doing that with the cost of doing it now. So we estimate the probability of the thing being full before the end of the next shift as a measure of this. Um, that's probability between zero and one, so we need to scale it to match the, the distances and the durations, uh, or the distances in the, in the cost estimate, because zero to one is not going to cut it. Uh, but that is not really hard. The really hardest part here is that we need to solve this fast. Like this is, this is something they want to use. They are not going to wait 30 minutes for a good solution. Um, after a lot of haggling, I got them down to one minute. Um, or I, I got them up to a minute. <laughs> um, shorter, shorter is better. <laughs> so uh, one minute is, is, is I'm, I'm assuming reasonable because we saw this table earlier, the gaps at that point for this thousand customer case were not that big. That is, if, if you want to solve this repeatedly, that's a reasonable gap. Uh, they also, they don't care about any form of optimality. They just want it to look good, you know? Like I care, I care that it's also actually a good solution. <laughs> to them is like, yeah, that looks reasonable, let's do this. Um, but if I, can, if I can keep reasonable, but do it faster, that's a strict improvement for them. So I'm aiming for a minute. If I can get it down to seconds, that will be worth it. Yeah, this, this is the thing. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty obvious when a container is full. It looks like this. Um, when it's not full, it doesn't look like this. So we want to avoid this. But because it's so obvious that a container is full, it's also really obvious to the driver visiting that container. They don't have to do anything complicated to see it's full. They just check, are there bags next to it, yes or no? Um, if there are, oh, sorry. If there are, they immediately see that. And we can use that. I'll go through that in a minute here. We can use that to get an estimate of how likely a container is to be full after a given number of arrivals since our last service time. Um, to do that, we need to track at the moment of service how many, service, how many arrivals there have been since la last service and whether the container was full or not. But basically, the question we ask is, are there bags next to it, yes or not? They've, started, they've built this into their app. All the drivers have an app. Everything has an app. Um, they have one too. And they are collecting this now. Um, okay, that, that's good because I'm almost at the end of content. <laughs> they, they've built this into the app. Um, they are collecting real, real world data on this now. So I can start using this uh, also, in our, also um, when, when we really want to fit these models on the real world case. Um, 
that takes a bit of time to collect. So because this is a really simple, straightforward setting, I'm not using any complicated models here. We, we do a pro bit on this uh, because you basically have a binary outcome and one variable that is predicting it. Um, the arrivals, I don't coordinate with anyone to deposit my bags, so we're all independent. You get uh, nice exponential inter-arrivals. Uh, the, the count process is, not, is Poisson. This is a really standard setting where standard methods should work really well. This is the last content slide. After this, we get to aims and ambitions. <laughs> um, so this is that runtime part that I want to, want to be short. Um, one minute we can do, but how much shorter can we go? Because a few seconds is, is really a lot better to them than one minute, because typically what they do, they look at it, they tinker with some weights because the route doesn't look nice and what nice is I have also not yet figured out um, but they tinker with some stuff and then they rerun it and that is a lot easier and a lot smoother if the rerun takes seconds rather than a minute um, so that would really make it easier for them to plan so this is the core research topic of this paper like can we improve these granular neighborhoods restrict this search space in such a way that we are done after say five seconds instead of 60 and um, the nice bit is that this is a repeatedly a static, static problem. The vertices don't change, the edges don't change. Um, the only thing that changes is this price vector. So every time we, we solve this, only the price vector has changed. All the old solutions, the earlier shifts, all those are feasible solutions to the problem now. They're probably pretty bad, depending on how different the price factor was that yielded that solution. So you get into this setting where, uh, that we heard uh, Andrea talk about earlier today, where demand can change, but the rest of the problem is fairly static. Um, the prices can change a lot here, but the rest of the problem is really static. Um, so one of the things I want to look into is whether we can reuse these previous solutions somehow. Maybe as part of the initial solutions, uh, when, we, when we run the argument, maybe some of the closest ones in terms of like the price factor that yielded them to the price factor we have today, um, maybe we can reuse those as initial solutions. But also, can we somehow learn an, a, a more general function that maps a price factor to a neighborhood structure? I'm not sure. This is the part I still have to figure out. <laughs> um, but I think this, this can work really well and can get us from this minute runtime down to a few seconds. So I've spent a lot of time on this. I've been working on this for a month or so now. We have a simulation. They won't let me test my stuff in, in the real world. So that was really sensible, but also boo. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have these baseline policies. Um, and what I want to do first is I want to try a sort of threshold policy using the prices because they, they do a cutoff now, right? After 300, 400 containers they can serve on a day, there is a cutoff somewhere. We can also base that on these prices. Um, I want to try that. Then I want to do our price collecting. And after that, uh, because it's methodologically interesting to get us from like one minute down to a few seconds, also work on these granular neighborhoods. And that is where we are with this uh, project. So. Thank you for your time. In the beginning, you mentioned that parameters were playing an important role in the solution quality, but uh, and, and the hyperparameter tuning didn't do a good job, let's say, uh, at this point. But you didn't mention how did you the parameter tuning. How did you tune the parameters and so, which were the main parameters here? Um, so what we did, like we have parameters in, in a bunch of groups. Some of them are related to population management. Some of them are related to, to uh, adaptive penalties over time for, to, to uh, give a cost to the infeasible solutions. Um, and there are a few that are related to the educate step, the local search method. So what I initially did, put all the, put all the parameters together, throw them into the uh, hyperparameter configuration thing, let it figure it out. Um, so that did not really work well. There is this natural distinction to three groups. We tried that again with the hyperparameter configuration uh, method. 
Um, that also didn't really work well. And after that, I was like, okay, but I can also just generate parameter combinations that I think will be interesting. And that we based a bit on, on discussion, like me and my teammates within the Euro Neurops competition, it was just a bit of discussion, like what, what is a reasonable set of instances to check, and of, of parameter instances, of parameter groupings to check. Um, we came up with 50 to 100 settings, some of which we randomly generated, uh, others which we fixed by hand, and we ran all of those, and we took the best one for each group. Um, so that's really prescriptive. Um, there is no necessarily a lot of exploration other than we have a few of these random settings and a few of the ones we fixed. But we did find a few improving configurations on the instances we were evaluating on this way. Whereas um, the smarter algorithm got stuck into in, in this noise issue. But it's, it, it was not, there was not a lot of uh, deep thinking going on in this. Yeah, smack. Um, I raced briefly, um, but that was Leon, my teammate, I think. He used some of that. And that ran into some issues that I don't fully remember, but we tried a lot with smack. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Two quick questions. Uh, what do you, where do you get this uh, value of PI? Where, where do you derive the value of PI? Is it the volume of every garbage that's emitted, or where oh. do you get that? For in, in the waste collection problem? Yes. Yes. So, th this picture, I know, I'm, I'm fitting a model to these observations uh, of, of the number of arrivals and whether it's full or not that uh, the, the garbage truck driver collects for me. Those are real world observations. At that point, I have a model, a probit model, and I know the actual number of arrivals at any given point in time where we are now. So when the shift gets planned, I know we're now at this number of arrivals. I have a reasonable estimate of the arrival process. It, it's Poisson, I, I know roughly the intensities over time. So I can calculate to the end of the next shift, expectation how many arrivals there are, um, how many arrivals there will be. There's a significant number, significant amount of variance in it. Um, and then I just plug that into the model I fit and I get a probability estimate. If I want to be more conservative, I might go for a CFAR uh, type approach on the number of arrivals. And uh, the implicit assumption here is that every arrival is more or less homogeneous. Yes. There's a big difference between arrival one and arrival seven. Yes. That could happen, but it's very likely to smooth out over the number of arrivals. And of course, the 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 uh, drum they have to put it in is is size constrained as well. It cannot be bigger than about a hundred liters. Their garbage bags, their maximum size, sixty five liters as well. So there is a natural upper bound on the size, and a lower bound is I'm not going to dump an empty bag. So there's, there is a reasonable range to this. That works fairly well. Thank you. So the, the resource, is the resource, uh, so assume that uh, you have uh, just a binary thing that tells that uh, if it is empty or not, uh, if it is full or not. So if you knew perfectly that they, which, are, which one are full, what will be, uh, you would be able to actually cover all of them or not? No, I mean, um, if I knew perfectly, probably yes, because obviously the number of vehicles I have is somewhat related to the number of things I have to visit. So I could, could vi probably visit all of the ones that are full. I cannot visit all of the containers on a single day. There are too many of those, but the ones that are full, two, three hundred maybe. It, it's, it's somewhat related to the number of vehicles and the capacity you have every day, because uh, else the problem would be explosive and all the containers would basically be full every day. And that's also not the case. So there's so, a bit of balance. So the point is, there is a dynamic component. So now you are considering only one visit at a time. But the point is that you can think it uh, over a longer period of time, minimizing the number of times uh, this, this uh, neighborhood, I mean you, 
you will find uh, your in uh, let's say in a month you will find your container actually full. Okay, so that is actually in a sort of fairness uh, over time the perspective. So you want to make sure that everybody around the city sees the containers full the same number of times. Yeah, that could be a next step. In a sort of Agreed. Step. I think I, I think we can do more with this. Um, for now, I'm trying to fit something into their planning system no, that no. already works a bit. But I it's think this is a good, this is a good same, next step. Overall, if you cannot, in any case, doing everything at the same time, then yeah. you can take a longer perspective. Thank you.